Well, good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, my name is Matt Dickey, for those of you uh, who don't know me, and uh, I do oversee our, uh, as Buddy said, our wildlife management here uh, at First Baptist Trussell. That would be the middle school ministry specifically. Um, and, you know, uh, wildlife management, I think, is, is a good term. It also kind of gets a bad rap because, um, I, I mean, our middle schoolers, we, we actually, it's really cool how uh, the Lord has been working in our middle schoolers over this past, um, really, few months. Uh, we had five students uh, who gave their life to Jesus at our last Wednesday night worship. And so the Lord is moving. Yeah, we can clap. We can clap for that. Absolutely. Um, the five students stepped from death to life in D now, which was back in January. We saw the Lord move. And so we've seen um, the Lord working and moving. Um, and we, listen, we do fun things and we do all kinds of uh, goofy stuff like um, many of you probably know. And remember me and Spencer got painted pretty much orange uh, for our students. We got our legs waxed, which we're still suffering from. Um, victims of our own stupidity there. Uh, and and uh, I've actually had, I've, I broke my ankle at the beginning of this year, which has been a brutal year. As you know, I was orange, legs waxed, uh, and broken ankle um, all in the same year. So it's been good so far. But, uh, but I've had to explain to my physical therapist, as I've kind of come out of this, come out of the boot, I've had to explain to him multiple times because it's been different people. Like, hey, you know, we do some, we're going to do some stuff on your ankle. Um, and I had to explain to him, like, hey, my ankle, my legs look weird. Um, it's, this isn't just something I do. Like, it's not, I don't just get my legs waxed, but um, this is just uh, kind of where I'm at right now. And I had to explain to him. It gives a good ministry opportunity. So there you go. If you want to utilize that, you can. I would, I would say don't do it. Um, but it's good to be here with you this morning. Uh, we get to open up God's Word. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and go to uh, John chapter 19. John chapter 19 is where we're going to be. We are in uh, the fifth I'm sorry, the sixth of seven uh, weeks and seven of the famous words from the cross by Jesus. Uh, we will be back in this next week with Jesus' final words from the cross, and then we'll roll into Easter the following week. Uh, we'll celebrate the resurrected King uh, on that week. And so uh, John chapter 19 will be in verses 28 and 29, and here's what it says. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And so uh, first thing we need, to, we need to look at before we can kind of see, okay, how does this apply to, to us is, okay, what's this verse saying exactly? We got uh, scripture being fulfilled, uh, Jesus realizing the end was near, or the end really, it was accomplished. Um, and then uh, we have sour wine being given to Jesus. And so what all's going on here? And the first thing we need to know is that John kind of, he sees Jesus and Scholars say that John sees Jesus as the fulfillment of uh, Psalm 69, 21, where David says this. He says, for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. And so uh, one thing we need to know, too, is that sour wine being given to Jesus on the cross wasn't like all of a sudden an act of mercy on behalf of the guards. It wasn't like the guards all of a sudden, they, you know, they, they beat Jesus, they nail him to the cross, and then they say, you know what, now, now, now I'm going to be a little bit merciful. Let's give him some sour wine to drink. No, no, no. The, the giving of sour wine to drink while Jesus was on the cross was to prolong his agony, to prolong his suffering uh, and what he was enduring on the cross. And so John sees Jesus as this fulfillment, um, that, that the sour wine given to David, again, kind of the same way, was not an act of mercy, but rather an act of, uh, in a sense, betrayal and abandonment uh, by his friends, just like Jesus was betrayed and abandoned uh, at the cross. And the second thing is that John's statement about Jesus uh, knowing that now was all finished kind of points us back to Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you remember, where he says that um, I've glorified you on earth. This is Jesus uh, praying to the Father. I've glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Ne Jesus knew his mission, and he knew at this point that it was accomplished. He knew that, the, I mean, last week we talked about the, the, uh, the Father's back being turned on the Son for a time. The sins of the world are poured out onto the Son on the cross. That Jesus knew that all had been finished, that all was accomplished, um, and that Jesus had fulfilled his mission. And the next, Jesus' words from the cross when he says, I thirst, shows us his humanity. This is kind of like the first time uh, we see or that Jesus is fully human. So this is kind of like the first time that we, uh, while Jesus is on the cross, um, that he says something that kind of points to, uh, very directly to his humanity. Like uh, thirst is a human, uh, a human response to uh, needing something to drink, right? And, and so we see that Jesus is fully human. Um, and this is, 
a, kind of a crazy mystery still to me that Jesus is 100% human and 100% God at the same time. Kind of like the Trinity. It's one of those things where you can understand it to a point, um, but then then, you know, it makes your brain explode. And you don't know, you know, we, we talked about the Trinity with our students uh, three weeks ago. Uh, we gave, I gave one of my teachers, and this was just kind of because of the format, uh, about 10 minutes to discuss the Trinity. And he was like, Matt, I really appreciate you giving me 10 minutes to try to unpack um, the most deep theological uh, understanding of who God is in 10 minutes. Uh, he did a fantastic job. And uh, he's, I think he's watching online this morning. Jared, you did a great job. Uh, and so, uh, but, but the, the reality of Jesus being 100% God, 100% percent man is kind of that same thing. It's not like Jesus uh, kind of subtracted some of his godness for a time um, while he, uh, I guess, raised his humanity. It's not like he's 50-50 or, hey, I'm 75 percent God over here while I'm doing miracles, 25 percent human or flipped it. No, I mean, it's 100 percent God, 100 percent man the whole time. And so what amazes me is that the one who is fully and completely God allowed himself to be, now remember, God in the flesh allowed himself to be arrested, to be beaten, to be spit upon, to be crucified on a cross. I mean, th think about this. Jesus, in, in, if you look back in the Gospels, as you read through the Gospels, there's multiple times where Jesus is, uh, a crowd is starting to come in on him, and then he all of a sudden it says he like, got out of the crowd. I don't know exactly how he did it, but it's like, well, Jesus got away from the crowd that was closing in on him. And, and like when he, when they come to, a, when they come to arrest him, this is one of those things where it's like, okay, he could do that, right? Or he could get out of this situation. He's 100% God. He's God in the flesh. He could get out of this situation, but he knew his mission. He knew his mission was to submit himself uh, to the beating, to the punishment, to the death for our sins so that we could have life. I mean, the, the act of, of uh, divine nature that, God, that Jesus shows while he's being arrested, I don't know if you remember, when he's getting arrested, they come up, Peter pulls out his sword, slices a brother's ear off, and then Jesus slaps it back on his head. Now, first off, let's just hold just a second, because that happened. Like, and, and the guards and no one seems to really, like, I even just read passages in Scripture, like, okay, Peter slices his ear off, Jesus just picks it up, puts it back on his head. And it's like, okay, and then this happens. It's like, hold on just a second, stop. Jesus just put a brother's ear back on his head, and the guards still continue to arrest him. And so it's kind of like, okay, there must be something up with this guy, because, I mean, I'm thinking the other guards, like, hey, remember when your ear got cut off, and then that guy put it back on? That was pretty cool. And then we arrested him, and now he died on the cross. But, I mean, but he could have gotten out of this situation, but he uses his uh, divine status for mercy. Uh, and then when he's on the cross, you have the elders and the chief priests who are there at the cross, and they're, they're mocking, and they, they say up to him, they say, if you truly are the Son of God, then come down from the cross. And so I'll, I always think, like, what would it have been like if Jesus would have said, whoop, it's me, what's up, right? Like, it's It's me. But he didn't do that. He knew what he was supposed to do. He knew the mission that he was put on. And how much more powerful is it to watch, it, to see a dead man walk out of a grave? I mean, think about that. How much more powerful is it to see a dead man walk out of a grave? Like, he may have persuaded a few people at the cross, but if you see a dead man get up and walk out of the grave, like that's powerful. That changes lives. And so that's what Jesus did. He knew his mission and also, too, we got to realize, too, Jesus' life wasn't taken from him either. Jesus' life wasn't taken from him. Like, it wasn't like Jesus didn't, like I've said, he didn't have control of what was going on. Like, this is what's crazy. The, the muscles that the guards used to beat him, the spit, the glands that produced spit, they used to spit upon him, Jesus had control over like it says in, uh, in Colossians, that Jesus holds all things together. That he was literally holding them together while they beat him and crucified him on a cross. He had control of it, and he knew what he was doing, and he did it all for me, and he did it all for you, so that we could be forgiven, so that our sins would be paid for, and so that we could have eternal life. He says this, Jesus says this in John chapter 10, verse 18, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. He has authority to lay it down, which he did, and he has authority to take it up again, which he did for us. C.S. Lewis says this this way, that the Son of God became man to enable men 
to become sons of God. The Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. So Jesus thirsted in our place, suffered and died to provide us with living water. So this is how, now we got to move to, okay, how does this apply to us? Like where does this, uh, Jesus saying I thirst from the cross, is we realize that the one who thirsted, thirsted in our place so that we could have living water so that we might never be thirsty again. That Jesus as the living water provides us with uh, a, a satisfaction and a sufficiency um, that only he can quench. And so let's talk about that. John chapter 4, if you got your Bibles, you can go back to John 4, same book. Just flip back just a little bit, and that's where we'll be for the rest of the time. Jesus, as you're going there, Jesus approaches a woman at the well, and there's a lot um, of things we could talk about in, in how uh, that conversation and everything goes. But uh, we'll focus on this, uh, that, that she asked him, or th- they begin to talking, and Jesus said, if you would have asked me, I would have given you living water. And then in verse 13, which is where we'll start, this is what Jesus says to her. John 4, 13 says this, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And then the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And so I think it's highlighted in your, um, in your listening guide, the, the two lines where Jesus says in verse 14, that we will never be thirsty again, and that it's a, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so it, it, I think they're highlighted, but you can underline them because that's kind of the two we'll be camping out on here for the rest of the time. And the first thing we need to know, what Jesus says is that Jesus provides as the living water, everlasting joy. That Jesus provides everlasting joy. It says in verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And so I think in this passage, uh, what we need to understand is that uh, Jesus is talking about two different things here. Okay? I think a lot of times we, we uh, accredit this verse to just talking about Jesus being the source of eternal life, which of course he is, that's what he says here in this verse. But I believe he's also talking about um, how he is the, uh, the, the living water that we will never be thirsty again here and now. So, so not, just, not just eternal life, which yes, of course, but here and now. And so let me explain what I mean by that, is that uh, ever-expanding, ever-increasing, everlasting joy is only found in the pursuit of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, can you have joy and pleasure and and peace outside of Jesus? Uh, Yes, only to to a point, though, right? That would be crazy to say you can't have joy outside of Jesus. Yes, you can you can experience joy, but only to a point. Now, what I'm what I'm saying is that everlasting fullness of joy can only be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so John 10.10 says it this way. Jesus, this is Jesus talking. John 10.10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And then John 15.11, similarly, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And so I'm, I'm always trying to get across to our students, um, of course, the, the fact that Jesus provides forgiveness of sins and eternal life in heaven um, and all of these good things for eternity, and we're going to get to eternity in just a second, but what I'm always trying to get students to understand is that Jesus is out for your good. Like Jesus is for you, our God is for you, he is not against you. You have an enemy who is against you. Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan wants to steal your joy. He wants to kill you, and he wants to destroy you and your witness. Like, he wants nothing more for you than for you to live in misery. Even as a Christian, if you've read the book, uh, how many of you have read the book, The Screwtape Letters? A few? Yeah, so a pretty good bit. So you're going to know what I'm talking about. Others of you probably won't know because you haven't read the book. Uh, but, but if you've read the book, you know that uh, the screw tape letters is about a uh, kind of a, a head demon who is writing to his, uh, his, his younger, um, I guess he's kind of mentoring him. And, and this younger demon has, has a, uh, a man who he's, who he's assigned to. And it talks about the whole time, hey, you know what, you want to keep him from, keep him from coming to Jesus is kind of the goal, pretty much. Keep him from giving his life to Jesus. Well, there's a moment in the book where the man gives his life to Jesus. Well, then uh, what, what, the, what the older demon now says is, okay, he gave his life to Jesus, but now the goal is make him miserable. Like, just make him miserable. Distract him. 
uh, don't, don't let him walk around with the joy of the Lord that's offered in Jesus. Uh, try to keep him from the hope that he has in Jesus. Try to keep him from the peace that's offered him in Jesus. Like, just keep him miserable. You have an enemy. You have an enemy that, wants, that is fighting a battle against you. My question is, how many of us know we're in a war? Like, how many of us know we're in war? I think sometimes we see it like, man, the culture's moving this way, right? Like the culture's, things are getting darker and things are moving this direction. I don't like that so much. But how many of us know we're in a war, like a spiritual battle we can't see? But we have a God who has fought, um, but actually has already won the war for us in his death and resurrection. And now it's saying, hey, I'm sending you off into battle with the tools you need. I've given you my Holy Spirit to empower you, to strengthen you, to overcome the temptation, and to walk in the fullness and everlasting joy promised in Jesus. Like, this is what Jesus wants for you. Like, I mean, Jesus, he said, I mean, he said it here multiple times. He said, I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I've I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Now, these things that he's just told them is uh, is actually, uh, he said, if you will follow my commands. Now, I know um, in this day and age, we don't necessarily like to be told to follow rules, right? We don't like to be told, hey, you need to do this, you need to do this. Like, we don't like rules so much. We don't like rules. But when, when God is saying in his word from start to finish, when he says don't do this or do this, it is not that he's trying to keep you from something. It's not like God is trying to keep you from joy. It's not like he's saying, hey, hey don't do this um, because I don't want you to have a good time. Hey, don't do this because I don't want you to experience the joy that, that all these things might offer. No, 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 no. When he says don't do this or do this, you know, when he gives commands, it's for our joy. Like it's so that he's actually could usher us into joy, not keep us from it. And so I think we, uh, we as people, we're driven by our appetites, right? We're driven by our appetites, um, not, not just for food. I saw, I saw some shaking of heads over here and I'm thinking, yes, I'm hungry, lunchtime is coming. Um, but he talked about a guy with a hollow leg that works on staff. He was talking about me um, because I love food. I love to eat and I can just eat and eat and eat. And he always tells me, well, you know what that's going to look like in 30 years? Um, and I always say, well, um, I'm just going to keep eating now, I guess, because it's, it's so good. I mean, I, I love food. But we are driven by our appetites for happiness. Like we're driven by everything we do, almost everything we do is driven by our appetite for happiness. Like we, we want to make ourselves happy, and that, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing, but we're driven by our appetites for happiness. And, and in a worldly sense, this plays itself out in two ways, I believe. Number one is it plays itself out in our pursuit of happiness in sinful things, and then it plays itself out in our pursuit of happiness in good things. And so let me explain what I mean there. Um, first, sinful things. So I have... Um, I got two sons, two boys. Uh, one is four and the other is one. Um, and they are awesome. Parenting, as, as many of you know, is the, the highest joy, uh, the highest, I mean, happiness. Like it's like the height of all emotions, right, at one time. Like you can be as joyous and excited as you can possibly be. And then you can be as like sad or, or you know, upset as you can be. It's frustrating. It's confusing. It's all the things at once. Like, hey, boom, parenting. And, and, and so one of the things that it is, is it, to me, and some of, some of the things my boys do is it's confusing. They confuse me sometimes. And so what I mean by that is uh, when, when my four-year-old was one and when my one-year-old, right before he could start crawling, uh, it's like they laid on the floor. You know, they lay on their backs and then they learn to roll over and then they learn to, you know, army crawl on the floor. And so right before, um, or actually, it's like right before they started moving and being able to move around uh, the house, you know, we got them laying in the living room. Right before they started moving around, it was like they were staring at one specific thing. And they were waiting, like, man, when I can move, I'm going to get that thing. And, and the thing that they wanted to get was the power outlet where you plug stuff in. No idea why. I don't know why that looked appealing. Well, there's a lot of other things going on in the house. And they are dead set. And I'm not kidding. This isn't just to fill a sermon illustration. This is legit. Like, my one-year-old now crawled and just tried to put his finger in the outlet. And you're thinking, hey, Matt, grab him. Well, I did. Well, you're excited that your kid's moving. You're like, hey, he's moving. This is awesome. And you're like, hey, good job, buddy. And you're like, oh, my gosh. And you got to go grab him because he's about to stick his finger in the power outlet. Well, Levi, who is our oldest, he, we had a little cord sticking out of the floor. He crawls over. 
and starts trying to eat the cord out of the floor. And I'm like, hey, what are you doing? So you pick him up, right? As a good parent, you don't let them stay there eating the cord. Um, you pick them up, you put them back down, and then they crawl over and you pick them up and they cry and they get upset. Uh, my my one-year-old last week, me and my oldest were playing baseball out in the front yard. Um, and my one-year-old went from the, the porch, you know, he was on the first step and he stood up and he ran straight to the street, just ran straight to the street. And so I had to grab him. You know, he cries and gets upset and I have to set him down. Then he runs back out there. And you know you have some, maybe some, like, things you're going to have to work on in the future. When, when you're one-year-old, you say, hey, 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 no, right? Everyone's done it. All the parents have done it. No, hey, hey, snap at him, right? No. And then, and then he turns around, he smiles, and then he runs straight to the street, right? I mean, I'm like, okay, oh, goodness. We got some work that we're going to need to do. Um, and, and, but, but a lot of us, I think, our pursuit of sinful things is very similar to this. Like, like we, we are, it, us pursuing sinful things to make us happy, like if it's, you know, hey, we run to an addiction that we have, hey, this is going to bring me peace for a time, I'm, I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I need this thing to bring me peace for this moment, and I'm good. Or we run, you know, we think revenge is going to be the best option in a scenario, hey, this person did me wrong, I'm going to get revenge on them. Like if I can get some revenge, like then I'll feel good, then I'll be happy. Like when we run to sinful things, uh, God it wants to keep us from those things, just like we want to keep our kids from harm. So, so when I pick up my son and, and bring him back and set him down so that he doesn't run into the street or stick his finger in a light socket, he thinks that's going to bring him joy. Because as he's running out there, he's laughing and carrying on and he's running, you know, all crazy into the street thinking that he's going to make him happy. Well, I know that the future of that is harm, right? And it's going to be regret on his side. Like it's going to be regret because it's going to harm him. And so when God tells you, don't do this, do this, and keep my commandments, walk in these things, it's not because he's trying to, uh, it's not because he's trying to keep you from something. No, he's trying to keep you from running into the street and getting hit by a car. That's what he's doing. He's trying, he's trying to usher you into joy, to keep you here, to keep you safe, so that you might walk in the joy that he has provided. Uh, but not only simple things, but also good things, right? We pursue happiness in good things. Now, what I mean by that is, is this. One of those things is money. I think money is going to bring us ultimate happiness. I know you've probably heard this a lot, but the money's, money is not evil. Money uh, just leads to all kinds of evil. It says the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, but, but money, we think, man, if I, just make, if I make this much, man, I'm going to be good. Like, we'll be good as a family. And then you get to that point, and you're like, oh, man, if we, just, if we made a little bit more, right? We made a little bit more. Like, then we'll be good. Then we can pay the bills, and we can, you know, that, that's when we'll be good. And then you find that people with millions and millions and millions of dollars are still uh, desperate and miserable and, and find themselves uh, wanting more, right? And so we know money can't satisfy. Jobs, jobs are good things. They won't satisfy. Relationships, relationships as, as great as they are, marriage and kids and relationships as great as they are, they will not satisfy. They cannot satisfy us. Confession real quick, but I, I, sadly I watched The Bachelor. Um, that's a big confession, by the way. Um, and we see relationships can't fulfill when, when he's dating 30 girls and he ends up with zero at the end of it. And so that, and that happens like 95% of the time. For those of you that's, that just question all my manhood, I completely understand. This is my confession uh, before you. But, uh, but I do. And so uh, it, it, these things will not fulfill us because they can't. They can't do it. They cannot fulfill you. The only thing that can is Jesus. Like we need to reorient ourselves around the reality that Jesus is better than everything else. Like everything else. Not, not, not Jesus is better than this. No, Jesus is better than everything. Money, jobs, careers, relationships, um, even family. Like all these are good things and they're meant to stir our affections and our thankfulness to the Lord, not take the place of him. Does that make sense? Like, not take the place of Jesus to, to give us joy, but rather we find joy in these things because they're good gifts from a good God. Like, the, the fact that Jesus is better than everything else is what we need. We have to grasp that as a people because I think we're continuing to kind of move into a time where if Jesus is not sufficient for you and you're going to find it in other areas, well, there's going to be more and more and more things offered to you to satisfy you that ultimately won't, but the, but the enemy promises they will. And so we have to reorient ourselves around the fact that Jesus is better than everything else. In Psalm chapter 4, verse 7, it says this. This is David. 
He says, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. So he's saying, let them pursue what they want. Let them have what they want. Let them have all these things. Grain and wine were symbols in that time of wealth. And so he's saying, let them have all the grain and wine they want. I've seen their homes. I've seen their, I've seen their cars. They didn't have cars back then, but now I've seen their cars. I've seen their beach house. I've seen all the things they have and let them have it. They're all good things, but I won't, if I've got Jesus, I'm good. Like if I've got Jesus, I am all sufficiently uh, covered and satisfied in the joy of Christ. Like this is what Jesus wants to offer, life to the full. Because when all those things are taken away, because we can't take any of them to heaven, the question is, when we get in front of Jesus, is he going to be enough? And I pray that he will be for all of us. Fullness of joy is found here and now in Jesus Christ. Here and now in Jesus Christ. But the second thing that Jesus mentions in this passage is that Jesus provides eternal hope. Jesus provides eternal hope. He says this, The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. A spring of water welling up to eternal life. See, we all need, desperately need eternal hope. Right, and the hope that we have in Jesus is rooted in the reality that that we don't get what we deserve, that we've rebelled against God, that we've sinned against him, that we've turned our backs on him and run away like the prodigal son, and that we don't get what we deserve. Psalm 103.10 says this, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Like, that's good news. Like, that's the gospel in Psalm 103.10. You do not get what you deserve in Jesus because Jesus took it for you. All the, the punishment for your sins, uh, the, the, the price, the debt that needed to be paid for your sins was taken on the cross, on Jesus. He absorbed it for you, the wrath uh, due your sins, absorbed by Jesus so that you would not be repaid according to your iniquities. Like that is the gospel. Here's the deal. We love when people get what they deserve, right? We love when people get what they deserve. Let, let, me, let me just paint this picture. Um, there was a story about a month ago. Uh, a guy was, a uh, mom called the police, called the police on this guy who was kind of sneaking around their house and was supposed to be peeping into their daughter's room. Um, the mom calls the police. Police come. They're standing outside, and the guy there, I guess they were maybe chasing him uh, or something. The mom's standing right in front of the, the, uh, the officer's vehicle and the camera. You can see her. Well, I guess the guy, the guy comes running past her, or he thinks he's going to. And like the mom's standing there, and if you've ever seen a good form tackle in football, if you like football in here, which probably most of us do because we live in Alabama, if you like football in here and you tackle like an Alabama player, not Tennessee, that's Tennessee is me, that, sadly, but tackling like an Alabama player, I mean, she stuck him. The dude runs across, he's like, yeah, mom, I'm just going to truck by her. No, you're not. Boom! And he hits her and drops, her, drops him. I'm sorry, she hits him and drops him. Drops in the ground. And I'm like, and I'm watching on my phone like, yeah! Oh, come and get that, son. I mean, like, like that's, that's, what, that, I mean, that's what I'm doing. You want to know why? Because he got what he deserved, right? He got exactly what he deserved, and he went off to prison because they arrested him because mom had him locked up, and he was done. He was done for him. Went off to prison. He got what he deserved. But here's the good news about the gospel is that what you deserve is that. Like the cross outs us for being sinners. It shows the depth of our sin, but it also shows the uh, unending, the breadth, the length, the depth, the height uh, of, of God's love for us. I mean, but God, I mean, it says this, Romans 5, it says, for, for while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like not when you cleaned yourself up. It's not like God's sitting here, if you're in here today and you think, man, I know I'm in church and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this sin, I'm wrestling in this area, um, but I've got to kind of get myself together. Uh, maybe, maybe you think like you're here this morning um, or you're watching online because you're like, man, I got myself together uh, somewhat and, and now I can come to church. I know that's the exact opposite of the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is you were running as far as you could from God and he chased you down. Like that God saw you in your sin, saw you in your wrestle, saw you in your struggle, and he said, you know what? I want that one. I want that one. And he redeemed you, and he rescued you, and he saved you from your sin because you could not save yourself. We all need an eternal hope to cling to. About 
uh, eight years ago, I think now, um, there was uh, a student who was in the student ministry here um, and passed away. Uh, it was just a terrible tragedy. I mean, awful situation. Um, and that Sunday, uh, there was a group of guys, and if you've been here for that long, you may remember this. A group of guys came to about this spot. This goes stairs all the way across. And we put the stage out here, but um, came here on the altar. Um, their fr- lost a friend. They came weeping, crying, broken, broken over what had happened over this tragedy. They came here and worshiped God, pleaded with God, prayed to God, and, and, and ultimately, I believe, we're just clinging to the eternal hope that we have in Jesus. Like it was in this moment that, that, that all they had and all they could cling to was Jesus. And, 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 what, uh, and, and the song that played over them was this. It said, and I'll never forget, I was sitting right over here. It said, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. That was the song that they sang and that they, they worshiped and cried and pleaded with the Lord. And the eternal hope that they clung to was Jesus. Because that's all they had. Like, I mean, the hope is Jesus is real, that he died for our sins, that he rose, and that their friend is in heaven with the Lord, and that is the hope and the eternal hope that we cling to. And sometimes it's all we have. And when it's all we have, Jesus promises that it will be sufficient. Jesus promises that it will be sufficient. That, the, that he, that he that like, listen, I'm talking about everlasting joy. Like, are there tough times? Absolutely. But what Jesus promises is to be sufficient in the midst of those tough times. He promises to be the one you can cling to for hope, for peace, for joy. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. Like, this is the God that we serve. This is the God that we serve. John MacArthur says this about the cross. He says, may we never take the cross for granted or miss its profundity. It was here that mercy and truth met together, that righteousness and peace kissed each other. The source of living water, Jesus, thirsted and suffered and died in our place. And his death on the cross fully and forever paid the debt for our sins. And his resurrection has trampled and defeated death and hell and grave and sin and our enemy forever. So that we could have the fullness of life now. And so we could have eternal life in heaven. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the fact that you do love us. The fact that you have gone to the cross and paid the price for our sins so that we could walk in the fullness of joy that that is offered. And Father, I pray for anyone in this room who's who's sought to replace uh, that joy and happiness in their life with something else. Father, may we lay that thing down. If it's, a, if it's something sinful in our life, may we lay that thing down, confess and repent of that and turn to you, the only source of joy, of true, lasting joy and the only source of hope that we have. So Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for that reality that, that you love us so deeply that you have paid the price for our sins. And Father, I pray you'd reorient our hearts and reignite our hearts for you. That you'd stir within us a desire to see people come to know you and to turn their lives to you. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.